Juliana, thank you for, I think the, uh, the point about filtering noise is the important bit there because there's just so much out there and if there's something like that, uh, Bill was just telling me that those 17,000 SMSs were done manually by people, so s sorting through 17,000, deciding, filtering the noise essentially and what Juliana's saying is that the technology is out there to, to make that a faster, quicker process. Uh, let's move on because we are uh, a little bit behind time unfortunately. China here in the news a lot, internet censorship, uh, Google versus China debate. We've got Kaiser Kuo with us, who is from Yuku, is that correct? Yuku.com, which I'm told is one of the, uh, or the leading uh, video file sharing site in China. Kaiser, come on up. Good afternoon, folks. Actually, I'm going to use this wireless mic if that's okay. There we go. So, uh, Google's announcement in January that it planned to actually decamp from China, that it would close down its, its search service in China rather than continue to censor, uh, generated quite a bit of, of column inches. There was a lot of attention paid uh, to a number of issues related to the Chinese internet. Uh, including you know, the difficulties that Western companies ordinarily face, especially internet companies, in actually doing business in China. Uh, there were discussions about cybersecurity. The decision to withdraw, evidently, was, was, was provoked by a particularly nasty hacking attack that took place in mid-January. Uh, and there were, uh, of course, an unprecedented uh, level, there was an unprecedented level of discussion about the issue of internet censorship. Discussions about censorship, um, of course, have tended to focus on the so-called Great Firewall of China, which I'll happily admit is an absolutely irresistible metaphor when you're talking about censorship and China. Um, journalists, after all, are in the front line of the trenches, of, or in the trenches on free speech issues, so it's no surprise that they would give them uh, as much attention as they typically have. Uh, but I think that uh, this tendency to focus on Great Firewall censorship has actually uh, crippled us in our understanding. Uh, it's understandable that this would be so. Google's position really fit very neatly into a, a well-established narrative uh, of an American company. In fact, Google, I think, more than any other American company, embodies a lot of values that, that, that Western, liberal Western democracies hold very dear. And there it was, you know, slipping very easily into the role of the protagonist, taking on an oppressive Chinese regime. You could you know, easily imagine Sergey Brin standing in front of the tanks in Tiananmen Square. Um, there is no question in my mind that censorship is a very important, very salient feature of the Chinese internet landscape, but by no means is it its only salient feature. Uh, the hubris of the Western media, especially in, in thinking uh, that only Western internet content really mattered ultimately to China, uh, that the truth somehow resides outside of the Great Firewall of China, uh, it tended to blinker us to the realities of the, the internet in China and actually to give short shrift to uh, the, the landscape of the Chinese internet, which is, is actually uh, quite robust and uh, quite fully fledged. It's a very complex ecosystem that deserves to be sort of looked at on its own. Uh, the Great Firewall, in the words of an academic acquaintance of mine, a guy named Lachman Tsui, has become uh, in the mind of Americans particularly, sort of a, uh, an Iron Curtain 2.0. In fact, uh, this, this, this metaphor, this, this whole Iron Curtain business was evoked by Hillary Clinton in no uncertain terms when uh, only nine days after Google's announcement, she made what she billed as an important policy speech, talking about how internet freedom would become an important plank of the Obama administration's foreign policy. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think that it's a core American value and it should be an important part of, of policy, but uh, she needs to really understand that you know, in invoking uh, Winston Churchill's speech in Fulton, Missouri about a, 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 an iron curtain descending across Europe, which she very you know, clearly did, she was sending very, very clear messages. Um, and like the mentality that really affected the United States during the Cold War, uh, what we've really done is created a couple of fundamental archetypes that are not dissimilar to how we thought about 
people behind the Iron Curtain. Now, behind the Great Firewall, we see, on the one hand, uh, a group of Democrats in waiting, just uh, longing to breathe the air of freedom. If it weren't for the, the repression of the Chinese internet, uh, they would be able to realize their democratic aspirations. Uh, on, on the other hand, we also have this notion of the netizens of the Chinese internet as a bunch of seething, uh, strident nationalists who are ready to band together in denial of service attacks against American interests uh, when they uh, see that a Chinese interests or the Chinese national dignity has been offended, as it seems so often to be. Uh, of course, the, the reality is somewhere in between. In fact, the reality is that it's often the same person that you're talking about, the same individual who has both these features of uh, sort of superficial cosmopolitan commitments and a very deep-seated uh, nationalism. Um, there's there's a, a, a danger, I think, in, in the way that the Great Firewall has been uh, singled out as the type of, of censorship that we, we talk about. It, it really distracts us from the real form of censorship that uh, affects Chinese internet users on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Americans, for the most part, I mean, Americans and Chinese are very much alike. They're both denizens of, of gigantic continental-sized economies where the vast majority of them only speak one language and uh, are quite insular. In this regard, their use of the internet is quite similar. Americans, you don't find them often surfing uh, Portuguese language sites based in Brazil. You don't often find them see, looking at anything except for uh, stuff on the Anglophone internet. It's, it's, of course, natural. And the same is true of Chinese. They rarely actually go outside of, of China in their peregrinations around the internet. In fact, it's very, very rare that they bump up against the so-called Great Firewall of China. That's not to suggest that the fact that Twitter, YouTube, uh, and Facebook, and a host of other sites, you know, the, the usual suspects, the rights uh, sites, you know, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, organizations advocating for Tibetan independence or for Xinjiang independence, of course, all of these are, are, are all blocked. And of course, that's, that's a, a, a thing that I, I find to be uh, you know, very regrettable. Uh, however, the kind of, of censorship that they, in fact, bump up against in China much more commonly, let's call it self-disciplined censorship, affects m many, many more Chinese people. It affects them every day. It's a kind of censorship where, uh, like I said, we'll call it self-discipline. The operating companies themselves, the blog service providers, the news portals, the internet video sites like the one that I work for, Yoku.com, uh, the even the gaming sites, uh, any site whatsoever in China will receive uh, from a number of, of possible ministries, from the Ministry of Public Security or from the uh, State Administration of Radio, Film, and Television or the General Administration on Press and Publications or any number of this, you know, this alphabet soup of acronyms in China. Uh, they will tell them where the no-fly zones are for the day, for the week, or for the month uh, and tell them that they need to actually conduct censorship on their own uh, they don't really care how they get it done. As long as it gets done, they can do everything from good old-fashioned redaction where they'll turn any sensitive words into just a series of asterisks or other nonsense where they'll uh, simply remove an account that offends too many times. It's uh, any way they want to do it, but as long as they get it done. And if they don't get it done, the ramifications can be very, very serious indeed. They can take away your operating license, your internet content provision license. They can come in and seize your servers. They can shut you down entirely. So it's a different kind of censorship. And, and it's, it's a censorship that, I, as I say, affects a lot more people. And it's the kind of censorship, unfortunately, that uh, well-intentioned human rights bodies, well-intentioned parliamentary organizations uh, can do much, little, much less about. The State Department can do very little about the fact that Chinese companies are compelled to censor uh, within China, which is an unfortunate thing. Uh, what I really want to get to, though, is, is that when, when we talk about, when we focus on this whole business of the, the Great Firewall of China, and we focus on the fact that Twitter and, and YouTube and, and uh, Facebook and all these other sites are blocked, we really are uh, not paying attention to a massive phenomenon that's going on behind the so-called Great Firewall. There are now 404 million internet users in China. 404 million. I mean, that's a third again as many as there are people in the United States. It's an absolutely mind-boggling number. There are close to 800 million uh, 
handset subscribers, mobile handset subscribers in, in, in China right now, about 180 million of whom regularly access the internet now uh, by their handsets. So we're talking about an enormous youth population. We're talking about companies in China that uh, unfortunately are, are not looked at very, very, very frequently. Companies like, for example, Tencent, which has an over $40 billion market cap. Uh, Bill May made a quick mention of QQ, which is an uh, instant messaging system operated by this company, Tencent, which actually uh, has, as a number of registered users, about 80% of all Chinese internet users. The number of active accounts on it, uh, because of multiple registration of accounts, far exceeds the total number of Chinese internet users. It's, it's really, truly mind-boggling. Uh, we talk about Facebook as the world's biggest social network, but if you count uh, the, the social media, uh, uh, social net, SNS users of uh, Tencent one, which is, which is called QZone, it actually comes very close to the total number of Facebook users. It's, it's really astonishing. And yet, most of us have never actually heard of these companies. Most of us never actually pay any attention to what's, what's, what's happening behind the, the so-called Great Firewall, and I think that's much to our detriment because we really don't understand uh, that it's an extremely well-developed ecosystem, that it's quite fully fledged, has an enormous number of companies doing just about any type of service or application or form of content provision that uh, we can find among Western companies. Some of them are actually quite, uh, quite innovative and have, have done things that I, I think we really ought to be paying attention to because we will be learning from them. There is a real central paradox in our understanding of the Chinese internet. Uh, it, it was fashionable for a while to sort of dismiss out of hand uh, the, the political uh, potentials of the, uh, of the Chinese internet. And that was because, I mean, it, it, I think it's still true to an extent that the internet in China can be described more as an entertainment superhighway than an information superhighway. And if you look strictly at, at behavior of, of Chinese netizens and you look at the, well, the applications that they actually use, you could conclude that that is, in fact, the case. Uh, but I think this really obscures uh, some very, very important things that are happening. As I said, there's a real central paradox. Over the last two or three years, there's no question in my mind, I think no question in the mind of anyone who watches the internet, that internet uh, censorship has gotten more restrictive, far more draconian. A greater number of sites are blocked by the so-called Great Firewall and the, uh, the restrictions on domestic sites have gotten far more onerous just in the last two or three years. There are people who say that China was on a trajectory heading more toward greater internet freedom and that it's just simply, simply been derailed by a number of, of, of external events by the coincidence of a bunch of sensitive anniversary dates like uh, the 20th anniversary of Tiananmen and the 60th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist, or of the founding of the People's Republic. But, uh, However, whatever the reasons, it's very clear that in the last two or three years, things have cracked down. But at the same time, and this is where the paradox really comes in, at the same time, we have seen, and really only in very recent years, the emergence of the internet as a full-fledged public sphere in Chinese life. A public sphere that has never really existed before in China. Right now in China, uh, there is all manner of discussion taking place over issues that I think many of you would presume would be simply off limits. Sometimes a certain amount of creativity is necessary in order to carry on these discussions and not raise the ire or draw the attention of the censors. But these, these conversations are really happening. The, um, the interesting thing that's happened, though, is that, that the government, at all levels, really, from the highest echelons of power in Zhongnanhai in Beijing all the way down to the lowliest county official, they are constantly now taking the temperature of public opinion as expressed online. They are constantly monitoring what people are, are talking about in, in the online world. And now, never, ra rarely does a week go by where you don't see decision makers at some level making, changing their mind in response to perceptions of public opinion. You see it happen constantly. There are a few cases that, that are probably the most famous, which I, I can talk about. One of them, there was an, an official in Nanjing a city in China, uh, he was photographed, actually, wearing, simply in the act of wearing a $27,000 watch and smoking a brand of cigarette that was clearly out of his pay grade. These photos circulated on the internet. 
people did a little bit of research and they concluded, just sort of popularly, that this guy was some sort of corrupt official. Uh, this prompted an actual investigation and he was uh, kicked out of the party and spent some time in jail. He's still phenomenon. I, um, I want to speak while, while I'm here just about a couple of things that I, I think everyone in the room here wants to advance internet freedoms in China, and I certainly do. Uh, but I worry about some of the things that I'm seeing happening. When Hillary Clinton uh, gets up nine days after uh, Google's announcement and uh, makes a, a speech about internet freedom, about global internet freedom, and decides uh, and announces that she's going, to, that the State Department has earmarked more than $30 million to develop circumvention technologies. Uh, how does that play in China? I watched it play. After the Google announcement in, in that initial week, I had, I've never seen that level of discussion about uh, internet censorship, very candid discussion taking place online in all sorts of different forums about internet censorship. Uh, but a lot of people, after Hillary's speech, changed their minds on the, on the subject. They thought, wait a minute here, uh, maybe what Beijing is saying about, the in, about internet imperialism, maybe what Beijing is saying about Google acting for, as proxy for the United States government uh, isn't a, a load of, of nonsense at all. Maybe, in fact, there's something to that. A lot of people peeled away from support of internet freedom. A lot of people started closing the ranks and sort of circling the wagons and, and uh, joining with their more uh, traditionally nationalistic compatriots in uh, saying, well, look, I'm all for internet freedom, but let's do it ourselves. We do not need the State Department coming in. I'm, I'm particularly aggrieved uh, at learning that it looks like some of this money is actually going to go to Falun Gong, which, uh, well, however you may feel about that organization, is regarded widely within China, not just by the government, but by an awful lot of Chinese people, as uh, what they call it, an evil cult. And uh, the fact that they're going to get funding, it, it now looks almost certain, and that they're going to be uh, beefing up a couple of circumvention technologies that they already have developed, uh, that really is going to work decidedly at cross purposes with the goal of internet freedom. Planting an American flag in the operation, uh, and then having a flag underneath it that says Falun Gong, and not such a good idea. Well, uh, my, my hope is that we're all going to approach the idea of internet censorship in China realistically, clear-eyed, and with a little bit more nuance than we have in the past, uh, with a, a very clear understanding that uh, the development of the Chinese internet is eventually going to overwhelm the ability of censors, irrespective of how well they run their technology, uh, irrespective of how many internet cops are actually hired. It will eventually over, overwhelm it and that uh, these freedoms must be taken, not, not given, and should be taken from within, not given from without. Uh, I, I don't address these remarks specifically to Bill May here, who's sitting there, who had actually nothing to do with, with this, as he told me earlier. But um, I really hope that, that we can uh, share this idea with policymakers outside of China. Uh, when the Director General here uh, talked about an initiative for internet freedom by Al Jazeera, I applaud that. I applaud private initiatives. I applaud uh, anything that comes from non-governmental organizations, that comes from news organizations like that who have a vested interest in it. But when it comes from states, I, I start to worry. Anyway, I, I think I'm probably chewed up my time here. Thank you very much, and I look forward to taking questions during the Q&A session.